I welcome you to today's Microbiome Center event, uh, another fabulous weekly workshop. Michael Morowitz is here from um, uh, University of Pittsburgh and the Children's Hospital. And um, uh, Michael's going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit about himself. The thing I'd like to say is that he got in contact with me primarily um, uh, with the idea that, that Pits the University of Pittsburgh is putting on, and with others, in conjunction with others, a Rust Belt Microbiome Symposium, and this would be November. In, November, in November, and so he's looking for people that will be contributing to that, and so you'll hear more about that, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you, Michael, for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thanks for allowing me to participate in your speaker series. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I was telling Professor Bull that I've I grew up in the Philadelphia area. I've been in Pittsburgh for several years, so Penn State is always sort of a part of my brain, sports, and whatnot, but I've never actually been here, so it's really nice to be here. Um, the, the reason uh, for me being here, so um, just as an introduction, I'm, a, I'm a, a pediatric surgeon. I'm a clinician who takes care of uh, kids um, and teenagers at the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, and um, I have a research interest related to the microbiome, uh, and um, I, I help direct Pittsburgh's uh, microbiome uh, re research center. Um, so there were actually, I was thinking before I came here, there was a confluence of events that led to me to become interested in visiting and then coming here. And um, I was driving today, I thought it was two events, and I realized it was three, it was actually four confluence of four events and those, and those are the following Let's see if I can remember them, all of them um, uh, I met uh, professor uh, Peck uh, Wong uh, last year as well as Neil Thomas who's an intensivist um, in, uh, Hershey and um, we can talk a little bit more later but we ultimately uh, just submitted a grant together um, mainly put together by professor Wong related to novel approaches to monitoring the human microbiome. So that started last summer, and the grant just went in. That was number one. Number two, I was giving a version of this presentation last fall at a surgical science meeting, and um, uh, Dr. David Soybel, who's uh, a surgeon uh, in Hershey, uh, said, you know, you really should meet with some of the food science specialists at Penn State. Um, and so that was, that was number two. Number three, a friend of mine uh, that works upstairs for me, Professor Tim Hand, an immunologist, uh, visited here recently and was telling me about um, the, the great work that's being done. Um, and uh, the fourth uh, was actually this, this Rust Belt Microbiome Symposium. And so uh, that will be, I'll, I'll show the date, um, I think it's November 4th and 5th of this year. Uh, we've gotten great interest from people in Buffalo, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Baltimore, um, Columbus, Cincinnati, and um, I'm very hopeful that Penn State will participate as well. We'll hopefully have speakers from all the institutions, and um, one of the main goals is to allow students, uh, graduate students and postdocs uh, and undergrads, of course, to uh, present work and maybe develop some collaboration. So, um, uh, so as I mentioned, I, I'm a pediatric surgeon. When I finished my training, um, it was 2007, so that corresponded with the launching of the uh, Human Microbiome Project from the NIH. And what really got me into uh, this field uh, was a particular um, condition um, of premature infants uh, called necrotizing enterocolitis. And um, that's really where I cut my teeth, um, so to speak, in microbiome research. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, there's an important link with antibiotics, newborn infants um, there, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today um, are conditions of older children and adults, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, and changes in the ICU um, as they relate uh, to diet uh, in the microbiome. I'll show this slide again at, at the end, um, but we just want to um, not lose sight of the fact that that's an important goal for today's visit. And if anybody would like to uh, communicate or 
get more information, please let me know uh, about that. So um, uh, th this, you know, visiting here, I, I'm expecting to learn a lot about a nutrition, but also plant-based nutrition because of the people that are in this um, uh, group. But I can tell you from a clinician's standpoint, um, the issue of nutrition is really sort of, it's one of the, you know, like anything else, the more you dive into it, the less you know. And the fact of the matter is, we don't really know how to define nutrition for a nourished person. Um, certainly different definitions based on whether you're talking about a newborn infant that's growing a lot in the first couple of months of life, or an older person. We definitely don't understand what that means for a, a, a acutely ill individual with unique nutritional needs relative to somebody that's healthy and doing well. And, um, you know, I learned, I've learned a lot about this over the past couple of years, but uh, just a quick anecdote. Um, I was, there's a podcast that I like to listen to about um, essentially the psychology and um, uh, related um, considerations for elite athletes. And um, the podcast host is somebody named Mike Gervais, who's actually a sports psychologist to a lot of NFL, well, NFL, a couple NFL teams in the U.S. Olympics. Um, and he talks a lot about how many, many people that are elite athletes, but the, what, what puts somebody over the very top to become a LeBron James or something like that is actually just a small sort of like um, push, whether it's psychological or uh, physical. And so at one point he had on a nutritionist who um, is, a, is a nutritionist as well to professional athletes and Olympic athletes. And during the course of this podcast, he was talking about the fact that um, when they have a, an athlete join a professional football team that they're working with, they run a battery of tests that you wouldn't even conceive of for a human uh, patient in the hospital. And they, they study hormones, they study all kinds of uh, micronutrients, um, which is a huge battery of tests. And based upon the test results, they'll tailor um, the diet of the professional athletes to their test results. And they've seen that they can um, uh, enhance the performance of athletes with, with diet alone. And um, it kind of makes sense. Um, and, and so I called this guy that I have underlined, uh, his name underlined here, his name is Chris Talley, and he has this company called Precision Food Works. And, uh, you know, he said he got like all this inquiry based on the podcast, but the reason he took my call and we had a couple conversations was that he had gotten to the point where he's starting to feel guilty and that um, the proprietary information of professional sports leagues um, and such is allowing athletes to recover from surgery or enhance their own performance, but it's not being shared by the general population, healthy or, you know, patients that are in hospitals. And so we've had a long talk about it. And um, bottom line is there's a lot more than we know. Um, and in this department, I'm sure you're, you're aware of that too. Um, here's just a couple definitions of nutrition or clinical nutrition. Um, again, I think at least from somebody on the clinical side, there are longstanding habits, the way we approach these things, but we don't really know what they mean. And um, if you're not familiar with this article, I highly recommend it um, from three, four years ago, one of my fam favorite articles of the past few years in the microbiome field. Um, is this something that you've encountered the, in this, uh, people in this audience? And it's really, yeah, I see, um, you've seen it. Basically, it's just sort of like very simple, but, um, mind-blowing idea, which is that if all of us in this room were given the same meal, it could be pretzels and hummus, or it could be ice cream, and each of us uh, were undergoing continuous glucose monitoring, each of us with the exact same dietary input would have totally different or very different uh, glycemic responses to the meal. And so that just, you know, this idea of personalized nutritional response uh, is mind-blowing in and of itself, but then what they went on to show is that there are certain genetic features, um, but also microbiome, gut microbiome features, which were predictive to somebody's response. And based upon this res test results in Israel, they formed a validation cohort demonstrating that they could predict, 
based on your profile, how you're going to respond to a certain meal, which obviously if you have diabetes um, is really key. So um, uh, as, as this group knows, um, the, the, the knowledge about what you eat and the bacteria in your intestine and its influence on health has been known for a long time, um, but has been sort of catapulted forward um, in the past 10, 15 years based upon um, well, two main advances. Number one would be um, the cost of high throughput sequencing to uh, really understand what bacterial genomes are like. And uh, number two, the application of the sequencing platforms to study um, all kinds of microbiomes, whether it be plants or um, mammalian. Um, but you know, one of the key papers in this field is from um, Jeff Gordon's lab, Fred Backhead, um, made a you know, pretty simple but interesting observation that a germ-free mouse that actually is eating more than a conventional mouse will uh, not gain weight as much as a conventional mouse. So there's something about not having gut microbes which affects your ability to take in calories um, regardless of what the specific calories actually are. And since that time, you know, the field has only uh, grown and grown and what, what I'm sure this audience knows very well, that uh, of the factors that impact the gut microbiome, probably the two best studies are antibiotic usage and diet. Um, and, and diet is something that I'm very fond of as a way to alter the microbiome because it's, it's natural, it's relatively cheap and simple. Um, and I, I really like this slide, which I just took off the internet because um, you know, when I was in medical school, I'm sure many of you um, sort of learned this idea of the gene environment product that leads to the phenotype of a person, whether you're tall, short, good golfer, not a good golfer. But now the microbiome is um, considered to be an important input to that, um, to that uh, consideration. So um, several years ago, I personally stopped eating meat and um, I for me it's been a good thing my wife and I both shared interest we feel good and that's held now for almost 10 years and around that time uh, seeing what an impact it had on my own body um, I was really sort of obsessed and still am going back to the hospital seeing that patients that cannot eat um, let me just say, have any of you encountered or, or have people in your own life that cannot eat and require extra nutrition? So you, if, you, if that's the case, you know that supplemental nutrition is based upon, um, for 40, 50, 60 years, um, the use of commercially available, um, chemically defined liquid formulas that can be conveniently delivered through a feeding tube, it can also be taken by mouth, shelf stable at room temperature um, we don't have a significant risk of contamination and they've been very helpful in, in helping patients that cannot eat like I said um, but and, and you know when you're going through medical training and I'm sure if you're going through uh, graduate school in nutrition or um, dietetics you don't even think twice about it I mean this is just the way that you help somebody get their nutrition if they cannot eat um, but um, the history behind it is, is something that's very interesting to me. Um, and uh, what, what it is is that um, 75 or 100 years ago, when it was first recognized that adding nutrition to somebody that was ill could help with their outcomes, um, what hospitals and nurses would do, and especially in intensive care units, they would go to the cafeteria and get, get some food, bring it back, blend it up, and put it through. Uh, the two, and um, but you know it's, it's, this was kind of the era of TV dinners, you know. So things that were convenient became more popular. Uh, marketing uh, from the from companies helped that um, essentially uh, replace uh, that more labor-intensive way of preparing um, blenderized foods. Also helps eliminate this risk of contamination, which is not insignificant. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is that 
these types of formulas, which are ubiquitous uh, in hospitals, certainly in children's hospitals, um, you know, in the era of picking up something at the grocery store and looking at the label to see what's in it, it's not, it's not pretty when you do that for these types of formulas. So um, uh, maltodextrin and sugar are high up on the list. They are the top ingredients, basically. Uh, what's missing is dietary fiber. It's kind of ridiculously low levels of dietary fiber. Um, and then they also have uh, food additives or emulsifiers, which um, you're probably aware of. in some cases have been shown to be clearly pro-inflammatory uh, to the GI tract. Um, one of my mentors um, 30 years ago actually did a really interesting and similar simple study where he fed rats different commercially available formulas and then uh, compared it to rodent chow, which is quite healthy actually, high in fiber. And also took one of the formulas and added uh, kernels from corn on the cob and looked at bacterial translocation to the mesenteric lymph nodes and uh, demonstrated that the normal chow, rodent chow, and the addition of corn cobs, the translocation rate uh, was really pretty low whereas some of the more common formulas led to a higher degree of translocation. So, um, you know, just to reframe it again, for the past eight, 10 years, I've just been really uncomfortable prescribing these formulas for my own patients, um, but not knowing that there was, uh, well, there wasn't much in the way of alternatives. And then uh, three, four years ago, I became aware that this concept of uh, pureeing or blenderizing actual food was making a comeback, especially in, for um, families with a chronically ill person at home. And um, there are a lot of benefits to that. You can, you know, if you're having some meal yourself, you can let the person um, uh, at the dinner table have the same thing, albeit in a liquid form. But it's labor intensive again. And um, so I became aware of a commercial product uh, called Liquid Hope. And Liquid Hope is a very interesting uh, product with an interesting story. Um, it was developed by a nutritionist whose father had fallen and suffered a traumatic um, uh, bleed in his uh, brain and was re requiring supplemental feeding. She picked up the label for the formula, was totally unhappy with it, and uh, sent, spent, essentially spent about five years developing an all natural formula that's shelf stable and provides um, not only required nutrition but probably um, goes above and beyond. Um, I don't usually dwell on this slide too much but for this audience I will. Um, you know, these are the actual ingredients. Um, this is actually Liquid Hope. This is a pediatric version that was just released two years ago. Um, and the ingredients are listed here and it's you know, basically like going through the, the, the produce aisle of the grocery store. It's extremely um, loaded with dietary fiber, uh, nine grams per eight ounces versus Pediasure, which has one, uh, and there are no artificial additives uh, at all. And so, um, uh, you know, I'm somebody that grew up in the medical world with a really sort of like creepy relationships between drug companies and physicians and when I was in medical school, drug companies would provide like incredible breakfasts and all these sorts of things, and you get pens and all that, um, which has subsequently been outlawed. But, um, and, and so I, I've always been sort of like really uh, standoffish towards companies, but I approached this company and since, and over the past couple of years, I've been working with their product, which they've typically given to me uh, for free without getting involved in the details of the research. but. Um, I want to make clear that they have provided me with a lot of this um, uh, product without any <coughs> financial relationship or conflict of interest. Okay, so with that in mind, um, there is a paradigm which I personally have come to buy into quite a bit, um, but I don't know that it's um, fully accepted at this point uh, with regard to the human microbiome. And this, this is most commonly talked about with re regard to the intestine. It's actually true in the airway um, for patients with cystic fibrosis or um, 
genital tract with regard to premature labor, this kind of thing. Um, and the paradigm is that an ecosystem, uh, the microbiome or ecosystem, uh, which is typically stable, when it gets perturbed, and I, I like to be clear that I don't often think that the microbiome is underlying a lot of diseases, they might be, but we don't know, but say with something like Crohn's disease, you have inflammation of the intestine. That then leads to perturbation of the ecosystem. Together, that's where the microbiome gene environment uh, connection comes together. You wind up with disease, but um, it, it's the cycle where the, the abnormal microbiome just makes everything worse because A, you lost the organisms that do a lot of good for the body. Um, you're all familiar with, um, I'm sure, many examples such as short chain fatty acid production in the intestine. So you lose those organisms. And they're replaced by pathogens, so typically things like Enterococcus, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. These may be, especially in my intestines, since I'm in the hospital all the time, but hopefully at a very low percentage. But in patients that are ill, um, those organisms become the abundant dominant organisms. Um, and those uh, microbes that have beneficial effects go away. So um, there's a lot of potential significance to this. So uh, number one, uh, there's the potential for a biomarker. Regardless of whether you know Crohn's is caused by microbes or not, you, you can assess patients' profiles to see maybe how they're doing. Are they at risk for disease, relapse, this kind of thing. Um, but you, you can look at response to treatment. Um, but also, there's a lot to be learned about positive, possible causative relationships. Okay, so um, uh, a topic that's very important to me that brings this all together, including the grant that um, Professor Wong just put in, has to do with patients that are in the intensive care unit. So um, the pediatric surgeon, um, that for those that aren't, probably haven't encountered pediatric surgeons, a lot of people refer to us as the last general surgeons. So, you know, 50 years ago, surgeons would in charge of operating if needed in the chest and the abdomen, wherever, um, whereas now, of course, everything's very compartmentalized and probably a good thing. But in pediatric surgery, that's not the case yet. And so we still do a lot. And one of the things that we do is take care of um, uh, trauma patients. Um, and um, so uh, patients that are injured or critically ill for other reasons tend to be in the intensive care unit for extended periods of time, tend, the very sick ones tend not to be able to eat by themselves. Therefore, they tend to receive both extra nutrition and antibiotics. Almost all patients in ICUs receive some sort of antibiotics. And so it kind of is self-explanatory that those patients will have alterations in the microbiome. But until microbiome um, field sort of had its start of the its renaissance 10, 15 years ago, not much was done in the way of characterizing exactly what's going on with these patients. Um, and so uh, a few years ago, um, we uh, put out one paper uh, in adults, and more recently uh, repeated this in children, and we have a third um, that's being put together right now, um, demonstrating a few points about the microbiome of critically ill people. Number one, when you compare them to healthy controls, so these are some PCA plots you're probably familiar with. These are healthy controls. These are ICU patients. Um, these are actually age-matched age healthy children. These are adults over here. And regardless of the body site, um, so GI tract, skin, and the mouth, critically ill microbiome profiles are very, very different from healthy individuals. And that's not too surprising, but what are the details? The details are that in general, the healthy anaerobic organisms, particularly in the gut, have almost disappeared altogether, and they're replaced by gram-negative pathogens, uh, most commonly from the phylum proteobacteria. 
um, human associated protobacteria that we're interested in are the gamma proteome, but um, probably those of you doing plant microbiome research look at others. Um, so so the, the good organisms tend to disappear. Pathogens replace them. And um, what's very disturbing actually is that typically in a healthy system, take, just take myself, uh, for example, samples from my GI tract, my mouth, and if you swab my skin, they look totally different. In fact, you probably know that if you just showed me some couple different microbiome profiles, we could say, oh, that's the skin, that's the mouth, and that's the GI tract. In, in ICU patients, that goes away. You actually can't tell. It's just it's quite disturbing from an evolutionary standpoint that you have things like Enterococcus or E. coli that all of a sudden are thriving on the skin or in the mouth. So what's, what's going on there that allows these organisms to thrive? Um, it's, it's a real problem. We've also been trying to tease apart some of the clinical factors. Um, there's a unique challenge to microbiome research in humans as opposed to <coughs> model systems such as animals, which is that although we're very similar in terms of our microbiota, there's just enough variation that it's, without a huge population, sample population, it's hard to come up, you know, you can't say that, for example, all patients with antibiotics um, see this organism grow and this organism go away. There's always a change, but it's different from patient to patient. And so I'm not going to get into this too much, but what we've been focusing on lately, um, this is a computational biologist in my lab, is um, what we call distance from healthy. And so on the X axis here is, is further distance from being healthy. And these are all rectal swabs, and these are two clinical factors, um, antibiotics or supplemental nutrition. And the orange uh, curves are, yes, they're getting antibiotics. Blue, no, they're not. Um, and down here, yes, they're getting nutrition. Blue, no, they're not. And so uh, with the extra nutrition, what, what's interesting is that when patients are getting nutrition, their distance from normal is lower. They're getting back towards a healthier rather than a lot of patients aren't stable enough to get any nutrition, and they're way out. Now, when they are getting antibiotics, they're also way out, but those same patients on days when they weren't getting antibiotics are closer to normal. That's the way I'm, we're trying to approach this uh, issue. We currently have a study uh, underway in the pediatric ICU and are in the planning stages of an adult ICU uh, to uh, randomize patients to these plant-based diets versus the conventional uh, diets. And um, that is the, um, the, the, the genesis for the grant and the, the project that uh, we put in with um, Pac um, Wong and Neil Thomas, I mentioned intensivist uh, Hershey, um, because um, as you also may know, monitoring microbiome profiles is, it's not like sending a blood test to the lab and finding out an hour later that somebody's hemoglobin got really low or white blood cell. You know, it, it, even if you had a sequencing machine set up just for this one patient, it would take a minimum, what's the fastest any of you have ever had some DNA-based microbiome data come back to you? Probably week for me. So. Yeah, yeah. So even if you had a machine, there's one paper from Rob Knight uh, in San Diego where they, they sort of had all hands on deck and within 48 hours they had some results for you know, a person. But that's not going to be very helpful for um, uh, patients that are having temporal variation on the order of hours, let alone days. And so um, you know, the, the, the WAN lab has come up with some. For me, really um, outside the box ideas for how to uh, monitor these changes, not based on sequencing, but rather um, with much quicker um, probes. Um, and so that's to, to be continued that story. But um, I think there's an enormous opportunity to impact clinical care with this with these proposed technologies. Um, so I don't have any data yet on nutrition in the ICU, but what we did um, just publish was a paper led by a medical student at Pitt um, who uh, enrolled a dozen 
chronically ill children that were reliant upon supplemental nutrition and they were using a conventional type formula and they were converted to plant-based uh, diets. Um, and we collected fecal samples before they switched, two weeks later and two months later, we compared them to uh, age-matched age healthy controls. And um, so before they switched over, that's the pre time point, um, alpha diversity is pretty wide ranging, but in general tended to be lower, but came up on the green plant-based diet. All of their samples, regardless of the diet, were pretty easily distinguishable from red healthy control samples. Um, but this is where the inner inter-individual variation for humans comes into play. Everybody seemed to have their own type of response, but everybody had a response to diet, and it depended on what was there in the first place. So in some patients, stool samples were dominated by enterococcus. This is not a good thing to have dominating your stool samples. And that went away um, by two months in this patient. The bacteroides, that would be considered a health organism. Gram-negative um, proteobacteria or enterobacteriaceae were present initially in these two patients. Um, and then it, it, it tended to go away. Um, ruminococcus is a short-chain fatty acid acid producing uh, anaerobe that was never seen up front, but in one patient you saw quite a bit of it after two months. So it gives you the, you know, the take home point is that different people have different responses, but I, I do think, you know, we, we did do some metabolomic measurements um, showing increase in short chain fatty acids um, after these plant-based diets. So I, I, do, I do think it's real. Uh, we also correlated it with some clinical um, diaries that were kept by care, taken by care providers. Um, huge issue with chronically ill people. You may know is that about half of them have very loose stool, half are constipated. So there's this scale for quantifying uh, stool production and number of bowel movements per day. And just on this very small, in this very small cohort, we saw that, um, so this is uh, very uh, loose stool. This is very hard or constipated stool before the trial began. And then by the end of it, we have this sort of like regression to the mean, so to speak, in terms of school school, stool school, which um, probably actually has health relevance, but um, as you may know, people are just obsessed with it, even if it doesn't have relevance. So, so that's a good thing. Um, and it gets to the overall topic of how fiber other components of the diet uh, can impact clinical outcomes, particularly in ICUs, a paper that we published a couple of years ago um, with one of my colleagues who runs the ICU at Children's um, that uses animal models of sepsis. And in these two different models, um, high fiber diet clearly improved outcomes relative to uh, normal fiber diet. Okay, so to switch gears to the other topic that we've been pursuing, um, inflammatory bowel disease, um, we did a, a study a few years ago uh, where children and, and teenagers with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis would come in with an identified healthy stool donor and undergo fecal transplantation if they met very specific inclusion <coughs> criteria. And um, you know, the details aren't too important, but what I do think is important is that even though we're talking about outpatients, totally different clinical problem, the patterns that you see are actually very similar. And so what, what I'm coming to believe in quite a bit is that kind of, you've heard the term dysbiosis, probably that could be on a plant or in a human. It, it can be defined differently, but there are some themes that tie together dysbiosis regardless of the you know situation uh, that you're the specifics of the situation you're talking about so this is a healthy donor high diversity recipient before transplant low diversity and before transplant healthy donors have these health healthy helpful anaerobes and the recipients shown in red have these gram-negative pathogens, enterococcus, again, you almost never see in a healthy individual. Um, and after transplantation, 
Um, so here's the recipient of a four transplant. Proteobacteria gram negative shown in red. They tend to dwindle quite a bit. Um, one week, one month. And then interestingly, you're growing back at six months in this particular cohort. Um, and this has led to uh, planning follow-up trials where patients uh, would have multiple fecal transplants because the, the one single transplant that, that we carried out seemed to have a half-life of um, a couple months for most patients. And not all, but many had a nice clinical response uh, to this transplant. Okay, so. I'm going to transition from talking about humans to animal models. Um, I just last week was out at a meeting called the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Association Congress or meeting. Um, and for those of you that don't uh, know it, I mean, there's <coughs> tremendous interest. This is one of the many problems that in the modern world is becoming more and more common and more and more severe inflammatory bowels. It's a big meeting. And they had an entire session dedicated to nutritional therapy for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And the crazy thing about this session, which I already knew to be true, was that there are two well-accepted and reasonably successful strategies to use nutrition to treat inflammatory bowel disease. One of which is enteral nutrition with these conventional formulas that I've talked about. A lot of drawbacks, but they do help people if they take them only without eating also. Sounds kind of rough, but a lot of people do that. Or they put patients on sort of very clean actual diet by mouth, sort of a paleo or um, exclusion diet where they're eating a lot of fiber, um, and no artificial preservatives. So completely disparate recommendations about how to treat uh, patients. A lot of confusion, and um, that's where I'm very enthusiastic about the research that we've been doing recently, uh, looking at these plant-based, commercially available formulas in various animal models. This is an interesting thing that, you know, as some many of you I know are in food science or nutrition, um, there's obviously gazillions of animal models. Whether you're talking about stroke cancer, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease. But what's really interesting to me is that almost all of those models and studies will not really think much about what the animals in the models are actually eating. Sometimes they'll tweak it, high fat, low fat, high fiber, low fiber. Sometimes they'll find a you know, particularly interesting molecule anti-inflammatory activity and we'll put it in the drinking water and show how it changes the outcomes. But what about the, what about the formulas that we're actually using with patients on a regular basis? And there, there's very, very little that's been done in this regard. Um, and so what we did was something you know, pretty, pretty simple, um, which was to start with some well-accepted, flawed, but well-accepted models of colitis. And um, what we saw couple years ago and have subsequently reproduced at least 30 times is that if you put animals in a colitis model, uh, these are two conventional commonly used supplemental liquid uh, formulas. Animals lose weight and get super sick. Uh, this is the dextran sulfate sodium model of colitis. And within four or five days, these animals just get very, very sick. Um, manifest either by weight loss or um, a quantifiable index of, of their health condition. Um, and the, the index of the disease gets much worse than if they're on uh, the, this product, liquid hope or normal rodent chow. Um, and those are always the best with the plant-based diet. And rodent chow animals tend to get a little bit sick, uh, but nowhere near um, the animals that are taking standard formula. So the question is actually, it's a similar question related to like breast milk or artificial formula for infants. But the, the question has always been, getting back to my other interest of newborn intestinal disease, is it that breast milk is protective um, or is it that artificial formula in some kids has some pro-inflammatory or risky profile? 
or is it some combination of both? So that that question is really applicable here too. Uh, we just published this. This is a surgeon uh, working in my lab uh, for a couple of years. Just published his paper uh, in a spin-off journal of gastroenterology. And the obvious question was, well, that model that you're using is a, it's a quirky model. And so we, we went back and tried several other models that are accepted of chemically induced colitis and then an immune or biologic model of colitis. And um, you know, every time we do this, the results you know, are the same, which how often does that happen in the lab? I mean, that's just either, either you have some structural source of bias or the phenomenon is real. And, um, I do, I have come to believe that it's real. Um, the obvious question is what's happening to the microbiome. For those of you that are doing animal or other experiments, um, you probably know the importance of randomizing animals from multiple litters, multiple mothers, multiple cages uh, together because of the uh, bias that can be introduced. And um, the animal, the diets are shown over here, colors, different colors, different diets. And before the trial of feeding, um, all the microbiome profiles look the same on a PCOA plot, but after seven days of feeding, they very clearly cluster according to diet. Here's rodent chow, the plant-based liquid formula, and then the two conventional formulas are essentially indistinguishable. And this is where we get back to that, that, that pattern that I want to leave you with, the, a, a pattern of dysbiosis, which is somewhat universal, and that is in the liquid, the whole plant-based diet, you see a lot of these anaerobes that make short chain fatty acids that are good at bile acid modification. Um, very low levels of these organisms in the liquid formula diet. This is before colitis, by the way. This is just feeding with the diet. And uh, when you look at the gram negative pathogens um, that I was referring to, much higher after one week of feeding with other formulas than they are with the plant based diet. These are multiple parameters of inflammation. Um, it's, it's obvious looking at these animals, but uh, biochemical uh, serum and fecal biomarkers uh, backed up the, the difference between groups. Uh, same with histology. Um, this is essentially normal plant-based um, animals that <coughs> take a plant-based diet that were exposed to the chemical still have essentially normal intestinal architecture as opposed to um, the animals on the other diet who have the normal features that get epithelium replaced by these essentially um, vacuoles um, and infiltration of inflammatory cells. We interestingly did see very interesting changes in bile acids um, that we're still pursuing, but I don't have much of a tidy story to um, provide to tie it all together. And what's even more interesting, actually, is that um, this is with mass spec based metabolomics. Um, amino acid levels in fecal samples were way higher in the um, conventional formulas. Um, and at first, we were just sort of blowing that off. But then this article came out um, from Crohn's disease patients and in animal models showing that bacterial enzymes involved in amino acid um, utilization can be correlated with disease activity um, and in fact what you see in those studies is that the amino acid levels go um, very very high and so um, I do think that there's something here with ammonia and nitrogen metabolism that is related to inflammation but I don't ex ex I don't understand it yet um, and um, I'm very pleased to say that uh, our microbiome center has a germ-free animal facility up and running as of um, last month, actually. But until that time, we did not, and it, and it took me a while to have access to germ-free animals. Um, but I ultimately worked with folks at, uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and um, did this experiment twice. It's sort of the most exciting um, lab result of, of, in my lab's uh, history, which is that the only time we've ever seen animals on a plant-based diet get sick, ever is when they're germ-free. So, and we did this twice, and, and here's weight change. And the animals on the green plant-based diet got very, very sick, uh, just like their controls um, in the absence of gut microbes. So, um, you know, it's a very strong indication that the microbes are doing something um, as a function of the diet. Um, 
where we are now is really sort of chasing down the mechanism uh, of this effect on one hand it may not even actually matter very much because we should we are just trying to get patients to take these formulas but it would be nice to know exactly what's happening um, one of the things that um, two people in my lab have been working on recently is taking fecal contents from the animals fed various diets and simply adding it to a culture of epithelial cell cell lines and um, when you when they add stool samples from these diets um, you see um, pretty rapid and substantial um, increase in pro-inflammatory markers uh, with the conventional formulas you know, and IL-8 but when you boil the samples and kill the bacteria uh, that effect is lost so that's more uh, evidence that the microbes as a function of the diet are coming together to influence the gut epithelium of course there's no inflammatory cells in this model it's just the epithelial cells um, but we're currently setting up the region to do the same thing with the dendritic cells and macrophages which I haven't done yet um, so I like to joke when I'm walking through the hospitals uh, at Pitt or the halls at Pitt or in the hospitals if I literally hear anybody talking about a knockout animal I will just grab them and say can I try that uh, can I can I Get some of those animals to see, you know, if we can figure out the mechanism of this effect. Um, and uh, you know, so we've tried some what I would say are rational targets: uh, PLL4, toll-like receptor four knockouts, uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptor uh, knockouts, uh, RAG knockouts that have no adaptive immune system. Uh, this is a mitochondrial defect. Um, all these animals are still protected uh, in the colitis model by the uh, plant-based diet. Um, so the uh, mystery continues. Um, more recently, we um, carried out RNA-seq um, of whole intestinal tissue as a place to start. It's not single cell, it's not one cell type even, it's just homogenized uh, whole tissue. And there are some interesting leads, um, probably the top two based on the RNA-seq data um, relate to cholesterol metabolism, which ties into bile acids. Um, but also, for them, sort of really jazzed up about the moment is uh, reactive oxygen species um, and the way that the gut epithelium handles that and the way that the, the diet and the micro, my, microbes interact with that. Um, the final topic that I'm really quite interested in, in all honesty in talking to this group about is vitamin A metabolism because. Um, Vitamin A levels in the packaged commercial formulas are far, far level than they, lower than they are in the natural sources of vitamin A, uh, retinoic acid in the plant-based diet. And I know that um, several people in this department have, have worked on retinoic acid um, in the immune system. Um, and we do see, like I said, some RNA seq signals of differences <clears throat> in, in written like acid metabolism. Um, this is basically the last slide um, that I'll leave you with. Um, and for me, this gets back to the my current paradigm of how this all comes together. And what I what I would like you to take away again is that although each of us and different patients are different in terms of dysbiosis or microbiome profiles, there are certain um, themes and, and patterns that tie it all together. And um, I don't know if any of you have followed or maybe even hosted um, the, um, researchers Andreas Baumler from um, uh, UC Davis and or Sebastian Winter from the UT uh, in Galveston or Southwestern. Um, but they've really driven these ideas. And so um, this particular review article, I highly recommend Nature uh, Reviews Microbiology. Um, Baumler coined this the germ organ theory of non-communicable disease. So what, what this kind of crazy title gets at is that non-communicable disease, I think um, Professor Paul used the term abiotic uh, earlier to talk about plant disease. Even when something is abiotic or non-communicable, there is 
an important role for the micro host relationship. And what, um, you know, what they talk about, and I, I really am coming to believe this, is that the oxygen and nitrogen metabolism right at the interface of the host and the microbe is, is super important and largely unexplored. And um, one of the things that I spend disturbing amounts of time thinking about is that when you take care of a patient, the last thing you would possibly want is for them to be hypoxic. So for those of you that are ACLS or BLS certified or any, you know, you, you want to, when you're resuscitating somebody, first two things are the, in the ABCs or the airway and breathing to get their oxygen levels up. But counterintuitive to that is you do not want any oxygen at the, um, at the surface of the gut epithelium. You want that to be a hypoxic environment that promotes the growth of anaerobes that do things like um, uh, alter bile acids and, and can generate short chain fatty acids. So, you know, as a clinician, you can't help by when you give somebody extra oxygen wondering well, what is happening to their gut epithelium. I better not think about it. Least. But um, uh, anyway, when, that, when somebody is sick, well, let's just say when, when there's less oxygen, you have these anaerobes doing all these things that are important. But when somebody's sick, you have neutrophils, um, the neutrophil burst, you have reactive uh, nitrogen species made by um, nitric oxide and other enzymes that provide electron donors an increased oxygen level, which number one, literally is lethal to a lot of anaerobes. And number two, those facultative anaerobes from the phylum proteobacteria, they like using oxygen and nitrogen as electron donors for respiration and, and, and their own fitness and reproduction. And, and, and that is that, that leads to that feedback loop that I alluded to earlier, which, which is that you know, those gram negatives aren't necessarily the cause of the disease, but they're certainly going to make it worse. And then, you know, microbiologists, um, such as many of you, have looked at how pathogens you know, use um, their virulent systems to then attack the immune system or the gut epithelium, which just sort of makes everything worse. So, um, you know, as this becomes tested and possibly validated, um, I think it does provide opportunities for intervention and to utilize um, that knowledge um, for biomarker um, development as well. So um, <clears throat> to conclude, uh, the point's just worth mentioning here. I think we're covered on that last uh, slide. I personally am very enthusiastic about um, plant-based nutrition for patients with unique nutritional needs. Um, clinical trials will be required to, to really um, you know, convince people that, that, um, that, that this, would, this would be a major change to move away from the typical formulas. Um, but I think to convince people, clinical trials would be needed. Um, and finally, um, uh, this symposium that I mentioned earlier on is meant to provide an opportunity for um, regional institutions and students to come together to find opportunities for collaboration. Um, there's tremendous work being done at a lot of institutions, but of course every local um, institution has some particular resources. Um, I particularly have a great need for metabolomics work related to vitamin A metabolism, and that's something I'm interested in talking about today, but um, the response <coughs> to my cold calls has been really, really good. Um, and uh, We actually have the, the speaker lineup almost finished. Um, we have yeah, it, it, it looks to be really good. Um, yeah, the, the Microbiome Center at the University of Pittsburgh is called Center for Medicine and Microbiome. Um, there is an analogous group at Carnegie Mellon University that we, they're particularly strong in, in pathogenesis of microbes um, and also big data. Um, and we work with them all the time. And this symposium uh, will be a joint effort um, uh, between the two of us many of you will come. Um, I do want to uh, thank the people in my lab that are pictured here, others on campus, uh, 
uh, at Pitt. Um, this is the this is the company um, that makes that one product. Like I said, they, they, they don't participate in any of this work, but I do think they're worthy of uh, acknowledgement because it's, it's a small company in Ohio, uh, sort of the David of the nutritional field taking on like large Goliath uh, companies. Um, I, I appreciate your time. These are my own little uh, notobiotic um, organisms and um, so in your uh, slice model, when you are feeding them these different supplements or important cows, is there right from the beginning before they get to DSS or anything else there, they're on that one? And then for one, on for one week. For one week before. So is it possible, like how much of the effect do you think is from like sort of inoculating them against harm by doing that initial treatment with it, and how much is the recovery after? And would you be able to, if you crossed over between like ones that were getting the other ones initially, and then after the SS went to that plant-based one, would you get that same recovery? Yeah. Um, so the, the sort of crossover experiments are um, underway right now oh, okay. to see if you can rescue somebody. Um, or not, but um, I, my take on this is that the, the plant-based diet promotes a healthy microbiome and doesn't seem to have an inflammatory response, whereas the other diets do. And so that then when you bring the insult in, those other um, communities are just at a major disadvantage, whether it's wound healing, stem cell function, all these things I think are possible uh, problems that um, with the plant-based diet the, the intestines seems to be doing a much much better job with when we need to sort of a mitochondrial function is a really interesting possibility too that there's some signal so yeah I think your ideas are really important and very interesting to hopefully soon see if we can sort of get an animal sick and then sort of rescue that would be really, you know, yeah, really. you're not predicting ahead of time that people are going to get played. Right? Correct. You're Correct. Right. Already, you might already be past that point. So. Well, yeah, and along the same lines, the, um, uh, I, know, I always thought that the enteral nutrition was really done on people that were really sick and not as like a maintenance therapy. And I think what you're talking about. Trying to lean, that was that first part of it. Because everyone nutrition works. Right? Um, yeah, I might need you to rephrase that. So, you, I'm rather, just wondering rather than if a therapeutic. you really want to develop your, you know, or change the diet as a more of a maintenance thing as opposed to trying to replace something like that, internal nutrition, that's already been shown that it works. Well, um, I guess the question is, what do you mean that it works? Because you know, patients that are critically ill in the ICU, for example, have enormous complication rates. Uh, so I wouldn't actually say that it works. I think there's enormous room for. But I, I guess I was talking about IBD. Yeah. So for IBD, um, so so there is there is a, a therapeutic strategy that you may know is called exclusive enteral nutrition. Um, and uh, it's, it's amazing that it's been shown that if somebody comes in and is diagnosed the first time with uh, Crohn's disease, you can treat them with steroids, especially for kids. You can treat them with steroids and put the disease into remission, or you can put them on these formulas. Um, and for whatever reason, that will also lead to remission in the same regard. But then the question becomes what they should be on in, in the future. Um, my own opinion is that Although these other formulas are clearly helpful, probably could have even better results if they were on the, the plant-based nutrition. Um, I'm not sure if that's getting into your question. Well, I mean, yeah, I was just saying that maybe, it, 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 I think we're almost saying the same thing, actually. It's, it's, it's <laughs> a question of whether I think there's therapeutic value or maintenance yeah. value. 
Well, I mean, they can't stand that until the nutrition goes correct. Long term, that cannot be the only way to do it. Yes, that is a major issue. Maybe a dose dependent sort of thing where you know, one day a week you know, intermittent fasting, or one day a week you do an animal diet. Like it's kind of trendy for other things that maybe other people don't encourage. But I, I think you're right. So, um, quite, quite possibly, did you see the, the, the slide? You only one slide talk about the sepsis and the relationship with the, the animal or the nutrition. Mm -hmm. Do, do, we, do we have an idea why why that works right now? Is it also microbiome related or something Yeah, I, I, so that one um, that one slide, um, those models were not done in germ-free animals, but they were done in animals that had antibiotic treatment to deplete their uh, microbiota, and, and the response goes away in terms of the benefit from the fiber diet. So. Um, I think that there is at least some role for the microbiome, so the gut barrier function, the mucus layer, um, <coughs> as well as um, local immune response, very tightly linked to which organisms are present. So, but you actually look at the, mic the microbiome, the profile in those patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were differences based on fiber content. No, is the gut or the, the other? That's in the gut. So I have uh, two questions. One for Daryl. Are you still taking candidates for your microbiome study? Yes. Yeah. So if you, if you want your own gut microbiome looked at with and without starch, talk to Daryl. And you've seen that in our, our newsletter. We can post that in there. Sure. Um, but uh, now a question for you related. Um, so the emulsifiers that are in these products, and I'm guessing is um, there, um, are they xanthan based? Are they bacterial based? You know? no, um, the one that I know the most of that's even in infant formulas is carrageenan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know enough to, yeah. to answer your question okay. about like, what and how that's made. Um, yeah, and then um, I think I want to say methyl cellulose is the other one that um, um, Andy Gewertz's lab um, in Atlanta had a paper in Nature showing the pro-inflammatory impact of uh, that and one other commonly used emulsifier. That could be the whole story, to be honest with you. Well, I think with that, um, well, thank you for, for a wonderful Thanks. talk. Thanks. Thanks.